thunder or the sense that someone calls your name We got one back from you all the hours that I cowered while you corrected everything I'd say Listening to the current, this is Jade, and that was all or nothing from Nathaniel Rateliff, who's joining us on the current today. Uh, the new solo record is called And It's Still All Right. It's out now. Thanks so much for coming in today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, how are you doing? I think I'm doing all right. Yeah. You're doing all right. I I have to say that uh, for me, I'm I'm a bit of a private person, and to 
write an album that is as vulnerable as you have written it uh, and everybody that you meet and everyone who interviews you kind of knows what's been going on in your life. Uh, I just have to ask, do you have any lessons for how you, you've been dealing with that? Or is that, are you very comfortable with that? Um, that's a great question. Um, it's, uh, it changes day to day. It depends on the person asking the question and how, how it's worded. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, day to day, I feel like, you know, everything, uh, continuing to find joy and to look at things with a positive outlook is always a choice, you know. So it's, I mean, if you look around the world, it's pretty easy to feel like a sense of hopelessness. So, um, And I'm really, you know, working hard at trying not to do that in my personal life and, and the, you know, in the outlook of escape of the world so yeah so what do you what do you do do you have like a self-care process going on for you right now um <laughs> i guess so uh, i mean i like did some yoga this morning and trying to stay hydrated but yeah fantastic yeah that sounds good uh yeah the process of writing this album uh going through a bit of tragedy in your personal life do you are you somebody who turns to books or do you listen to music when you need to you know delve into that sadness or are you picking up your guitar immediately and writing songs um i i write a lot i think until recently i wasn't uh really allowing myself to be honest with myself to realize that uh, writing is a part of the process for me of um, dealing with grief or dealing with um, all sorts of things, even the way I look at myself, the way I see myself or the way I see the world. Um, you know, it's, it's like... So, yeah, I, think, I guess uh, I pick up the guitar, but I, I kind of just play most of the time anyways because I enjoy it. And then, you know, every once in a while a song comes out of that and then... You know, sometimes writing, you don't realize what it is you're talking about. And then it has this, like, element of being, maybe it's just your subconscious, but sometimes it feels like you're, it's like prophetic, like you're writing your life, you know? And um, it's hard when, you're, you, when you have that sense and it's about hardship, you know? That, that honesty, what was, was there a turning point where you felt like you were, you know, do you, do you remember the moment where it felt like this is true? Um, I mean, I've always realized it. I think in the past, when I was writing about things and I knew what they were about, I was being very protective of the people that um, I might have been writing about or the circumstances I was writing about, not just the people. Um, but I've kind of room, removed myself from, I'm far enough removed from those situations now that um, I feel free to write about it and and also take the responsibility that if somebody was to examine the words and see themselves in them and know that they're the character, that I'd be fine with defending my reasons for writing that, you know? Yeah, be able to stand up for that. Mm -hmm. Have you had a lot of people after the shows reach out to you and say, you know, I went through a similar situation or I... Yeah, you know, share their own story. Um, yeah, over the years, even with Night Sweats material, um, and even back in the day, uh, you know, or just people saying that uh, that they relate to the songs, you know, or they, and I think that's the you know the thing about music that I love so much because I I do that myself um, when I listen to other music, you know, and sometimes it's you know it's like either a, a cross between wishing you had written that you know song <laughs> or or just even, um, I don't know, like you identify with the characters or you feel like that song was written for you when it's, you know, like it is the bummer about like giving up too much information about who the characters are because then it, it doesn't allow the listener to develop their own story or to connect their story to the songs. Yeah, yeah keep it kind of hazy watercolor. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a hard era to have any sort of mystery, uh, you know. When, you know, it's like 
people share the pictures of food they had for breakfast. So there's like, there's no secret. There's no discovery. It's, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, you can you can know your your favorite artist much much closer uh, than than previously. Is is there a song that you feel like is is one that you listen to a lot? Not your own, but somebody. Uh, and maybe it is just to get you out of this mindset. Is there a song that you've been listening to a lot lately? Uh, I was listening to Jim Sullivan's song uh, "Plain as Your Eyes Can See" from the album UFO, which came out in like sixty nine or seventy. I can I can see you digging on that vibe, especially with the the Are live you fam- show. Familiar with that, or? Oh, I I've played it once before, but I can I can picture I can picture the the era and the time. Yeah, it's very familiar to me. Like my mom was like sort of a '70s folky kind of writer, and um, and and like that was the, what I heard a lot in the house. So, but I feel like Jim Sullivan's like the cooler version of that that I never got to hear. You know, like it sounds cool. Like I like the arrangements and yeah. So it's like revisiting your childhood, but in a better way. Yeah. It's like a little, not as accessible Jim Croce, you know? (laughs) Yes. Um, well, I, I wanted to go, uh, before we hear this next song, there's a quote that kind of ties that first song that you played and, uh, the song we're about to play which is called And It's Still All Right, which is the title track. And you were talking to Rolling Stone, and you said, uh, you know, And It's Still All Right was kind of more what you want to carry with you than all or nothing. And I, I was hoping that you would explain that a little bit more for us. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I think what they were trying to say in there is I had, I had uh, originally I was going to name the album Rush On, which is a pretty heavy song. And I thought that it might, uh, you know, usually uh, when you see a title track, you're, you gravitate towards that. But I thought that was <clears throat> maybe a bad example of what the whole record should be, you know, even if it is a lot of, you know, even if the meaning of the record has a lot to do with the meaning of that song. Uh, and so then I thought, all or Nothing would be great because I, I was really proud of the song and I wanted people to, like, I wanted attention to be drawn to it. And it's, it's not like, a you know, uh, the arrangement itself is kind of uncommon for modern day music, which I like. And it was also something that Richard and I, Swift, when we had planned on making this record together, um, I had played him that like the, an earlier version of it. And he loved it and was like, man, you can't be too Nielsen, you know? Yeah, and <laughs> I was going to say that it, it has that kind of a, fun yeah. playfulness. Well, we intentionally, too. like, with, you know, from remembering him say that, I was like, well, let's just see how Nielsen we can get on it, you know? So, but then also, you know, that as being the title seemed sort of sarcastic or tongue-in-cheek. And then I, you know, also felt like the record meant more to me than than it coming across as being sarcastic. So... I ended up having a conversation with somebody else, uh, this woman who wrote the bio for the record, which is funny to do a new one of those for every record. I was like, can't you, do we have to do this all the time? Just take take the last one. Yeah, how much have I changed in the last three years? Um, Anyhow, but she was a fantastic writer and a fantastic lady. At one point, you know, she was like, so like, well, I'm surprised you didn't call a record and it's still all right because, you know, it it kind of touches base on, uh, of like what each one of the songs sort of is trying to talk about. And it, and it kind of, yeah, brings it all together in that sort of sense. So, well, so. well, we'll keep uh, chatting about the album and you and uh, the live show in just a moment here, but... I do want to hear another song, so let's hear it. The title track, and it's still all right. It's Nathaniel Rateliff on The Current. It ain't all right hardness of my head Now close your eyes and spin around say by the times that you couldn't find it ain't the way that you want 
but it's still all right. Late at night, lay around wondering. Counting all the lines, it ain't so funny now. Say, times are hard, you get this far, but it ain't the way that you want. I'll be damned if this old man don't start to count his losses. But it's still alright. See, you learn a lot out there. How to scorch and burn. Gonna have to bury your friends. And then you'll find it gets worse. We're standing out on a ledge with no way to get down. We start praying for wings to grow. Oh, baby, just let go. And it was cold outside when I hit the ground Said I could sleep here, forget all of there Baby, it would take time to grow But maybe I don't know And I hate a night to think about it Remembering all the times she pointed out, say, glass is clear, but all this fear, well, starts to leaving a mark. Idle hands, all that stands well, from your time in the dark. But it's still all right. That is a live version of And It's Still All Right. It's Nathaniel Rateliff here on The Current, and that's the name of the new album as well that's out now. Who was the first person that you played the album for once you finished it? Hmm. I think in its early incarnation, I think maybe Eli Thompson, who played bass on a couple of the songs, was at my house, um, <clears throat> and it was actually around the anniversary of uh, Richard Swift passing away. And so we, Eli was a longtime friend of Richard's, and they grew up together, even as far back as Richard going under the name of Dickie Ochoa, which um, not a lot of people know, I guess. Yeah. And <clears throat> so they kind of grew up together, and and Richard, you know, would always refer to Eli whenever he played bass he'd be like i just try to do what eli would do you know but <clears throat> they're very similar characters because of their years together and um so it was nice to like he just came and stayed at my house and we ended up listening to some stuff and yeah you know i, I appreciate his opinion too so and he he actually produced the first two delta spirit records as well which you know those are good buddies of mine and those are also for me very important records you know yeah. Do you remember what he said when the album was done? I mean, I, when he came in to, when he when it was done, actually, he was just like, well, I would probably do this. And, you know, he gave me some, like, <laughs> some it was more back. like from a producer standpoint. Yeah. But even when he came into the studio uh, and, like, when I was playing All or Nothing, he walked into, at that time, we were still at National Freedom at Richard Swift's studio where we started the record. Um 
And Eli just happened to be in town, which is very strange to be in Cottage Grove, Oregon, which is kind of nowhere, really. It's like south of Eugene, and um, <clears throat> unless you're going up to five, there's really no reason to stop there, you know, on your way to Portland or Seattle. But he was like, yeah, man, I'll be in town. So I was like, okay, we'll stop by. And he showed up and had his bass, and I was like, I think you should play bass. Like, he started listening to All or Nothing, and he's like, sounds like Nielsen does Newman, man. I was like, perfect. <laughs> I was like, you play bass on it? He's like, oh, yeah. So, you know, it was pretty fun. So, yeah. Do you have any, <clears throat> any memories of Richard Swift that you wish you could write a song about? You know, now. <laughs> There's so many. I mean, it would be a hilarious song. We we laughed. I never laughed so much with someone. Um, you know, that's sort of the devastating thing about, like, feeling that utterly, you know, like that your brokenness is only yours, you know, when, and I think that's what I, you know, I try to write some of these songs about is trying to, <clears throat> talking about being vulnerable and allowing ourselves as people to be vulnerable um, to one another. I think it's important. We don't really do it enough. And it, you know, like that unexplainable brokenness is a part of the human experience. And um, I think by, Allowing ourselves to talk about it, like I said, it makes it not so singularly ours. And and I don't think it's something that we should carry. I don't think it's something that Richard should have carried around with him. Because in the end, I think it just became too much for him. You know? Yeah. Well, it is It is one of those things where uh, the weight the weight of it, I think it gets it gets pretty heavy. So I, I think to be able to, to share it, yeah. 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 Um, like I said, I think it's important to talk about. It just makes people uncomfortable. But I think know. everybody could use a little yeah. uncomfortableness from time to time. Exactly. How how has it been playing the songs live? Uh, it's really been great to. Um, there's ten of us on stage, um, so for all these years, um, I've always been very limited to what I could do. Um, live for the for an audience versus what happens in the studio and even in the studio we've always you know I've always been very true to uh you know everything being very real and analog you know like not um I hate moving things around I, I like mistakes in songs and um but yeah you know you can have these big arrangements um even with leaving all those little mistakes in but being able to pull that off live has always been pretty difficult, just for even like financial reasons. Um, to like have ten people on tour. Yeah, you can't is, do that when you're <clears throat> eating ramen and. Uh, I mean, you can't. I still eat ramen, <laughs> but you know, uh, but I just go to a spot that makes their own noodles. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> upgrade. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, you know, it's. Um, I know there's bands that have done like ten people in a, in a, in a in a van, uh, but that's pretty hard. That doesn't usually last as long as you think it would, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, so, um, it's nice to be able to present the music in its, in its true form and in the way, um, we sort of, in the vision we had for it and to be able to bring that to an audience. It's really exciting. For you personally to, <clears throat> to share these songs, does it feel cathartic? Does it, to you know, be to sing these lyrics that are uh, drenched in in memories. Uh, does does it feel different? I guess now when you're performing them than when you were originally writing them. Um, it depends on the night. Sometimes it does feel like it's you know that first moment uh, you have that. Um, boy, what has a way to describe that? You know, there's um there's a curiosity that. That, that is there when you're first um, writing a song, just like newness. Um, and a, there's a, a um, there's a bit of fear that comes with that too because you don't believe it's yourself, you know? Uh, and so there's certainly that in performing this live sometimes, you know? And then, you know, it's also sometimes like certain words won't affect you or the song won't affect you. And then other times uh, it feels like you're just reliving the moment, you know, so it can be, can be a lot of things, but yeah. Yeah. 
But it's been it's been fun so far. You had the the first night, the big kind of kickoff. Uh, yeah, I'm. You know, I made a couple of mistakes that I preferred not to make, but yeah, keeps you human. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, let's hear uh, one last song. All right. Nathaniel Rateliff's new album is, and it's still all right. It's out now. And before we hear that last song, I do want to thank today's engineer, Michael DeMarc, producer Derek Stevens, and video production by Nate Ryan. And thanks to the Charles H. Clay Charitable Trust for its support of the Currents in Studio Sessions. Nathaniel, thank you so much for stopping in today. Thank you for having me. Uh, what song do you want to play last? This one's called Time Stands. It's Nathaniel Rateliff, and it's on The Current. <laughs> Are you just too old? 